Hi, everybody. Welcome back or welcome to session 15 of, of Track G. Uh, so today we have um, um, Anthony Algeman, uh, who is going to talk to us about data leadership for transformational change program. So, um, Anthony, thank you very much uh, for your time. And by the way, my name is Prashant Sautekal. I'm one of the track producers of this conference. And uh, Anthony, over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Prashant. And I am going to attempt to share my screen and we'll see how this goes. All right. Did we did did we achieve victory? I think we did. OK, Let's see how that goes. All right. I think we're good. OK, so I have a couple things I have to kind of level set with the uh, content that we're going to talk about here. Um, First and foremost, I don't represent any company at this point. Any of the stories that I tell, any of the things that we talk about today, these are all uh, experiences that I've had, but they do not reflect anything other than my own opinions. So I do not represent any organization. I do not speak officially on behalf of anyone, even my own organization. We'll leave them out of this as well. My my company, <laughs> no, we'll, we'll leave that one aside as well. Um, I, I speak on my own behalf and I want to relay. And the, the point of this talk. And what I want to do with this talk is give you a sense of a different way of doing things and why uh, in a massive undertaking, uh, it can be very difficult to achieve um, your objectives, even when you know uh, what to look out for. Because I've been around, I've done a lot of things, and I you're going to hear some things that I tried to do or some strategies that I had in place to try to avoid common pitfalls. And I managed to find uncommon pitfalls or lesser common pitfalls. And so we'll talk about some of those things. And hopefully it'll provide you some good learning experiences, which it's it's certainly been for me in this kind of undertaking this kind of adventure. And I will say that, uh, you know, in, in full disclosure, I'm no longer part of in a consultative or full-time employment capacity, the organization which I'm going to discuss uh, some things today. And so I, I won't share any uh, specific details, but I don't think they're that important because this is really about the learning journey and about what real courage in an organization is about to, to do something big. And that's something that I have a tremendous amount of respect for, that we even had the opportunity to do what we're going to talk about today. And so what we're talking about is data leadership for transformational change programs. And what we mean by transformational change programs, we mean something that will change the very way a large business unit works in a, uh, in this case, uh, research capacity R&D uh, organization uh, in um in the in the healthcare space, we'll just say. So, uh, data leadership is really on saying how do we leverage the capabilities or provide the capabilities of data in a way to drive a fundamental rethinking about the way an organization works. So, we're talk about some of the things that we intended to do. We're going to talk about some of the timeline in which we attempted to do them. Some things that I tried to do in my role in this to help us be more successful. And talk about way you know some of the things that we learned along the way and where where things stand and where things may go in the future because this is a journey that has only really just begun, not something that has seen its its full conclusion. And so, let's get into that. Let's see, that didn't work. Okay, that. So, what started this for us was this idea that in this organization it was a very large organization, um, you know. 50, 100,000 people involved with, with, with uh, employees and, and contractors. And the organization, the R&D organization had this observation. It was around 2019. This was before I was involved. And they said, you know, we look back, and, and I think it's, I have to talk about, it, it's a pharmaceutical organization. And, and in the drug development process, as, as a pharmaceutical industry, if we look back over the last several decades, we're not a whole lot better at finding new medicine. Like when you look at the percentage in, in the drug development process, drugs fall out of that process, candidate drugs fall out of that process in pretty predictable ways at various stages. So you have different kinds of, of um, you know, research uh, and in vitro and silico uh, clinical trials, various stages of, of approvals. Ultimately, 
to eventually release a medicine. And, and the percentages of which drugs fall off and become non-viable hasn't really changed in decades. And this is industry-wide, not, nothing to do with the particulars of, of the organization. And they're like, uh, we should be better than this. We should do better than this because we have all this data and all this technology. What use is all this data and technology if we're not getting better at the fundamentals of our business? Seems reasonable, right? So I say, okay, well, what, what do we do? Is it because the data is bad? Is it because we're bad? Is it because you know, it doesn't apply to medicine? What are the things? And what they, what they decided, what they realized is that, you know what? There's a lot of things that we do with technology, but what we don't do a very good job about is string together pieces of information, pieces of insight, pieces of knowledge in a way that allows us to capitalize on previous work or work happening in different pockets of our research organization. Everything is very linear in, in most pharmaceutical organizations because the scientists have their very specific domain and they do their stuff in that domain. They don't do a really good job sharing across a whole bunch of different areas. And that's something that we can uh, help through data and technology said, okay, there, there may be something to this, right? So he said, you know, what might, what would it take? What might it take? Great ideas. Great ideas come from the notion of, I wonder what it would take to do this, or I wonder if this is possible. And we had some very progressive leadership at the organization. And they said, yeah, I think we, we can do this. And we said, you know, what we need to do is we need to do something big because you don't partially do something like this to transform billion dollar impacts, right? And so they said, okay, we think we understand why we're not too good at this. We think there's an opportunity here to get better at this. And we're willing to make an investment to make that happen. So great leadership. Again, this all happened prior to my involvement because I wouldn't have been involved. <laughs> <laughs> they not had that kind of vision, right? I was not a, a person in this industry at all. I just know data. Yeah, you know, I'd been a chief data officer. I'd done data systems. I'd done technology at every conceivable scale. And that's where I end up coming into the picture later on. But without that senior leadership vision, none of this happens. So kudos to them for realizing that this is going to be a big swing. If we're going to do this, it's going to be a big swing, not a incremental 5% type of investment type of thing. Okay. All right. So a couple things though, they said, well, the way we want to do this, and ultimately they knew, you know, that they're going to be making a big investment to make a big transformational change to the way their R&D organization works. To do that, they needed insights from the outside. They needed insights from people who'd been there and done that. And nobody in the pharmaceutical industry had really done that before, quite at this level, really at, at anything comparable, which again, bold vision, right? So the thing is though, and you may find this in your own organizations in a slightly different way, but I would ask you to consider this is that there's specialists tied to the fundamental nature of your business, in this case, scientists, that really know science, that really know how the details of the organization's core business work, but they may not have the experience or the appreciation or you know, the ability to really see outside of their own blinders. One of the things that we talked about in this company and, and the nature of the way a lot of the research scientists work is this idea of a bed of nails. A lot of the people that work in research in pharma have their very, very tight target area of the thing that they understand in some cases better than anybody else in the world, right? And they go real deep with that, but they're very you know, narrow in that depth. And you have a whole bunch of them all throughout the organization that work in kind of that model. And so the thing is, is that they go very deep and they cover collectively cover a lot of ground, but they don't necessarily interact at every level. 
Maybe at that core organizational level, they come together to some extent. But for the most part, they're off on their journeys in parallel, right? Like the picture that you see, they're all kind of doing their own thing. Creates a canvas, a canvas with a lot of gaps in between, right? So you may be able to support a person laying on that bed of nails, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to support pouring water into it. It would just flow through, right? So there's a lot of little gaps there, right? So the other thing is that science is weird. Science is not like normal business, right? You're doing research. You got 10 year product development cycles. You've got things that can take a very long time to come to fruition. You know, in a lot of cases, you have situations where if you are a pharmaceutical researcher and you get one drug that makes it to market and creates something of, of real value, you're a tremendous success in your career when you've done that. And that is the kind of standard that, that, that we're dealing with. So what does that mean though? This means that there are disincentives to sharing information, sharing that wisdom, doing all of the things that we just talked about that the progressive senior leadership wanted to do. So you have at the senior level, a clear objective, a clear understanding. But as it goes further out into the bench scientists and all the people doing the work in a 12,000 person R&D organization, you have a lot of concerns around people who may not be as inclined to share all of their wisdom and work with one another when the biggest fear that they may have is that their research leads to something that they don't get credit. This is a person's life's work. Of course they want credit and of course they deserve credit for that, right? So it's not fair to just say, hey, you know what? You're working here. You should give all that credit to the organization. It's about the organization. You know what? That's not how people are wired. The fact is, is that people do have personal interests and you, those need to be respected, right? So the complexities of why some of the things exist the way they do are not irrational, but they are challenges. Right? So we want to start changing that. First off, we have to understand it. Second off, we have to appreciate why it exists and why it's important. We can't just say, ah, forget that. That doesn't matter. We've got bigger, important things to do. <laughs> Not with the scientists you currently have, because they're going to leave if you don't respect them and the work that they care about in their life's work. Right? So it has to fit together. Right? So on top of that, there's a lot of just basic skills that scientists don't necessarily understand what we've been talking about at a CDO IQ event around all of these norms around business data and sharing data and data governance and all these things that we love to talk about data, data, data. You know, they're focused on science. There's data involved, but data sharing is a secondary consideration at best, if it's even in the realm of something that they would consider, right? So that's that. Additionally, <laughs> scientists, doctors, medical professionals, anybody really who is a deep functional expert in something that most people don't understand tend to not like when other people, businessy people or consultants come in and say, hey, you should do a bunch of different stuff. Like, what? But no, 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 not interested, right? And so there's that. And, and you know what? That's not irrational either because a lot of times the consultants in various contexts have come in and been like, here are a bunch of ideas because we got to get paid. <laughs> you know, they're not even, they're not even good ideas a lot of the time. So what's going to be different about this time? Scientists are like, ah, eh, you know, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. Right. And so it's not irrational, but it is important to recognize that these are things that you're going to have to contend with. Maybe it's not scientists when you're in your business doing this, but it's going to be somebody. Somebody is going to know something that's so tied to the core of the business and they're going to be resistant to anybody coming in who doesn't understand that stuff. You know, especially when you're dealing with highly specialized things like doctors and scientists, PhDs all over the place. They're really smart. But sometimes that smart can also create additional blinders because of an unwillingness to see that bigger picture. They're so focused on what they know, right? So in our case, in this story, we are contending with a group of folks that have an above average resistance to change, right? And so in this case, we we, we understand the circumstances, right? Industry-wide, we're not doing as good of a job as we think we should. We have a big goal put forth by senior executives who have said, it's time to do something big. We have a 
broader community of folks who have at least average, probably more than above average uh, resistance to change, right? Okay, so challenge, challenge accepted. So here's the deal. This all started happening right about at the time, you may have heard of this thing that was called COVID, this pandemic that went around in 2020 or so. And that uh, amplified the importance of all of this very quickly. And so to, to the credit of the, of the senior leadership, they had already embarked on this journey, uh, but I think the pandemic really amplified the confidence and the importance and the urgency of making this possible, making this real, right? And so the timing of it was such that it made a lot of people like myself think about, okay, what's important to me in my career, my family, what I'm teaching my children, what I'm doing with my time, especially in the context of a global pandemic. And that, that will come back around in a moment. So our goal here, just to be clear in what the objective was for this massive transformation program, our goal is to overhaul a 12,000 person research and development organization with a roughly six, $7 billion uh, annual investment you know, how do they work with technology, data, with each other, and ultimately double that efficiency, double the productive output from it. So when you're doing that, the thinking about, okay, how do we, like, literally, the, the goal is, like, how do we bring all of the data in this organization? I, it's a lot of data, right? A lot of data is involved with pharmaceutical research, right? And so how do you bring that all together? and help people start using it in incredibly different ways than they've done in the past. Okay. Well, the hardest part in all of this is trying to teach 12,000 people who are highly resistant to change to do something different. That was clear from the beginning, like technology, blah, 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 data, blah, 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 blah. You know, getting a bunch of scientists to get on board with massive change, going to be the hardest part, clearly the hardest part. Nobody disagreed with that, right? So we get that. Now, that's not to say, <laughs> that's not to say that building the technology system was going to be, that is not going to be simple. That is going to be challenging. We had, you know, we were setting out on a mission where some of the technologies we needed didn't exactly exist, certainly didn't exist or hadn't been proven at the scale in which we were going to need them, right? So we realized like, yeah, big swing, right? So building the technology program, the platform to handle all of this demand that we were trying to generate through a bunch of scientists being asked to do something wildly different, uh, we knew that was going to be no small task as well. And that's really where my role comes in is to help lead the charge in developing that technology platform, the, 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 the bones upon which everything else would be built. So... And I think, and I and I and I look back to I can remember this vividly when I was talking to the the VP who was in charge of kind of the whole thing, and and everything was kind of happening underneath him. And I remember in, in the interview, which was remote because it was pandemic time, um, I, I remember vividly understanding basically what I just explained to you, and saying and, and realizing that well, neither of those two things are the hardest part for me. Because I get like the 12,000 people changing their behavior. Yeah, that's the hardest part. That's not my job, right? So that's the part that I'm like, okay, well, that's that's a bigger collective effort. Yeah, well, that's going to be tough. But building the technology part, that's not even the hardest part of my job, right? My fear, my concern was once you get to that kind of scale, the real tough part isn't the data, isn't the technology to support the data. It's all the context around it. It's all of the metadata. It's all of the, where did this come from? The data lineage, the provenance, where and why is this something I should use? How do I navigate all of the mess that we're gonna create, all of the data that we're gonna bring together in one system? Like, it's one thing to bring all the data together in one system. It's a whole nother thing to have people be able to find it and use it productively. We're asking all these scientists to do exactly that. We better give them the tools to make that happen. And that was the thing that's terrified me in what we were about to do. 
because and, and and actually, you know, this is a week where you've heard not a little bit about AI, artificial intelligence, and you know, certainly something that's just mainstream, top of mind for everybody right now. The robots are going to take over, right? And so, one of the big challenges with AI, as we're all pretty familiar with, is um, throw something to Chat GPT, get a random bio. You know, good chance half of that bio is completely wrong. Problem is, can't tell which half, right? It all sounds pretty good, you know. Generative AI is really good at coming up with things and asserting that it's not, you know, making it sound really good, making it sound true. Where it struggles is saying, this is why this is true. This is where this information came from. And it's not a simple fix because think about what is AI? It's like this massive inference engine that puts together a bunch of stuff together. We can't even read the code behind it because there's no code behind it. It's literally black box. You can't understand it because there's no nothing to understand it's it's made all of these connections and there's no way for a human to dive into those connections and say well that one's right that one's wrong that one's right that one's wrong it doesn't work that way so solving the provenance question for ai is way more difficult than getting ai to work in the first place it's easy to get ai to turn out a bunch of crap it is not easy for magically having ai turn out something that's actually correct right? So there is a parallel to what we were trying to do. And this is the problem is that you bring in tons of complexity. And if you do not have your head around the context and helping people have the navigational tools and the things that they need to self guide themselves, then you're going to do one of two things. One, you're going to give them a system nobody uses. Welcome to every data lake ever. Or you're going to have to handhold them through it all, all the time, and you're going to be a huge bottleneck, so nothing's ever going to happen. Because nobody's, you're never going to have the resources to shepherd 12,000 scientists one by one through the big mess you created, right? So to me, I see that as a metadata and context and a navigational challenge that if we didn't get on top of, we're going to have a whole lot of pain as we try to scale, right? So this leads to... Anthony was like, yes, I'll take the case. I'll take the job. It's a global pandemic. Never done anything quite like this before. The mission's very important, and it is, right? Find better medicine, help transform how a large R&D organization's working. Sign me up. It's COVID, man. We got to do this. So I took the job. And I don't regret it, certainly. I do wish I had not been so eager to help. I was kind of like, hey, let's go. It's too important. Point me to the shovels. Let's figure it out. We'll go as we go. What I should have said is, I don't know if you guys are really serious about this. And I should have demanded that I had more opportunity to do the things necessary to handle all of the concerns I just articulated. So a little bit of foreshadowing, but we will get to that. So one of the things, though, once I did take the job and realize, hey, uh, this is all new. It's all Greenfield. One of the, the cool parts is that I got to hire a team. I'm like, well, I mean, I, I could build out the organization that I want to have do this, work, you know, make this possible. So I'm like, well, this is a big undertaking under any circumstances. We have some unique challenges here, but nothing that I haven't seen before, at least to some extent. I think I can see around the corners. Let's let's talk about how do we avoid the way most of this stuff happens, right? So I made a joke earlier, not a very good one, but I made a joke about data lakes, right? Because what happens when most organizations undertake a data lake program? They're going to build out some sort of massive data repository, lake system, lake house, whatever you want to call it, and some of your meshes and fabrics and other crap terms are thrown around in there. but the fact is, is that a lot of times this gets headed up and the program managed by your technology organization, your IT department. And what ends up happening is you design it out and you spec it out. You, you work real hard with the business and you try to understand what the business needs and blah, blah, blah. Usually it's not as um, uh, forward looking as it should be. I, you know, I don't understand why so much of our effort is in building things for today when that's not going to be done for a year. Like, can we please start specking systems for what we're going to need when the system's ready, not for what we need today and we don't have? Like, 
maybe we should start, you know, start working on that. But what ends up happening, regardless of how forward looking we are, we put all our energy into building the thing, right? We put all our energy into how do we make the widget or the system or the lake or whatever, how do we make that there, right? Well, so this is really, it, it speaks to me because as, as a person who has built businesses, who's done consulting, who's been all over the place, it's really fascinating to me how people can go their entire careers without understanding a single thing about business. Because clearly people don't realize that to be successful in business, you need customers and you need customers willing to pay for something, right? And that's true in any industry. It's not, it's not just you know, regular business, but like even government agencies, like they have a limited budget, they have to get tax money, they have to appeal for funds, blah, 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 right? But a lot of the time we don't think about um, if we need customers and we need people that are willing to invest something in us for de delivering this, um, maybe we should make sure that they know this is a thing. Maybe we should make sure that they know that we built this. Maybe we should ask what they think if what we're designing would be useful to them or not in a year. Maybe we could learn from some of that, right? But a lot of times we're just too focused on building the thing as it was spec, however it was spec, right? So we put all our energy into building the thing, right? And that could be six months, could be a year, could be multiple years. It really just doesn't doesn't matter. Put all this focus in. This is also the same dynamic that leads to us never having enough time to test. I'm sure somebody out there right now is nodding their head, right? Because you focus all this energy on the build thing. Eh, we'll get the, the, the testing. We'll just, we'll knock that out. Yeah. That's when it you identify all these new problems and then it's just chaos, right? That's why every program is green, 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 yellow, yellow, red, 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 red. Like, we're so optimistic and so predictably bad at this. <laughs> and yet we act like this is the first time the pro program's green, 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 red, red. You know, this is not an unpredictable scenario. But regardless, so we release the thing, right? We're like, okay, we put all this energy in. We're going to release this thing. Hey, everybody, this thing's here. This thing is here now. And we're like, hey, we made this for you. Hey, everybody. We made this data lake for you. Isn't it great? It's got all the stuff. And they're like, we're busy. <laughs> yeah, we'll read the email later. It's fine. You know, so we tell them, you know, we're, we're going to let them know that it exists and we've, we're here to save them, right? But people are busy and they don't know why they should care. They don't know what a data lake even is half the time. So they ignore it, right? They ignore it. And then we're like, why isn't nobody using our thing? You know, I have a whole talk I give around how data, it's not the data lake's fault. Your data lake sucks. It's the fact that you didn't treat it as an actual product. And I, I am, for one, I hate the terms data mesh and data fabric. I think they're terrible terms. I think they're confusing and they don't mean anything. But what I do like is this notion of data products. I do like this notion of how do we help create something that has that complete picture in mind where people are given a value proposition. Maybe they're even given a return on investment estimate. Maybe they're even given a reason why they might want to buy something or invest in this. So if we think about these things more completely, then we might have more customers. Internal and extra, doesn't matter. Basic human functions about using stuff, trying to create value for an organization, right? It doesn't matter if you're selling it publicly or it's an internal program. I wish people would think more about how are we marketing and encouraging people to do something that we think could be useful for them. And then learning, if it's not, let's learn from that, make it better. And let's also recognize, like, nobody owes you anything. Just because you built a thing and worked really hard on it doesn't mean that it was good. Doesn't mean that it was helpful. You need to meet them where they are, you know? So it's, it's about understanding and then giving them something that they can really put into use. So I knew all that. <laughs> I knew all that. I've been ranching about this stuff for years. So I'm like, okay. I know that's coming. We're going to we're going to figure this out. So the thing I did, you know, and my role is building this this platform and building the platform team to build the platform. First person I hired for my team was an adoption lead. 
And I still remember the side I, that I got from the VP. He's like, wait, you're supposed to be building a technology team. What in the hell are you doing building an adoption? You know, hiring an adoption lead as your first hire. They don't do technology. And I'm like, this is way more important than you might think. Later on, I was vindicated. He even admitted that I was right. So that was good. But <laughs> we brought in the adoption lead and we sold the heck out of this thing. We engaged with the community. We found how we could make it better. We learned what they wanted. We, we were in training programs, marketing plan, like the whole thing. The adoption lead was unbelievable. She was just a machine at generating the interest in, and making this connection that so many large technology programs fail to make. I was so proud of what she and her team were doing in all of that. It created a new problem for us because we oversold that. Now, granted, it's the problem you want to have. You want to sell and you want to create the demand. You want to have more customers asking for more things than you could reasonably deliver because that's demand that pulls you towards them and encourages the building of momentum. This is how businesses grow, baby. That's great. Unless you don't invest and grow in the business and then you can't meet any demand. So everybody gets really mad when you can't meet that demand because you don't have the ability to execute. So if you swing that pendulum too far, a little bit of foreshadowing, you move that pendulum too far, then you're going to create a whole new set of problems problems that we managed to learn from experience on. So bottom line in this, I was right, but I overdid it. <laughs> I take responsibility for that. Um, but I still, I think it was, it's the right problem to have. But we talked a little bit about the strategic vision of those senior executives, which I think was just brilliant, full of courage. However, as we went further in the program, we did lose our way, in my opinion. I think there's plenty of people who disagree with me, but I think we lost our way in a pretty substantial way. So the start of that was, again, something that you probably want to do. I've heard it today multiple times. Start small, build momentum, go, 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 find that viable you know, MVP, get some people on the, the bus, all that stuff, right? Yeah. There's a reason we talk about that. It's a good idea. You got to do it. But <laughs> it's uh, it, there's risk also, right? So building momentum through use cases, it's brilliant. And it's, and it's key. And it's exactly, again, what you want to do. Use cases are great in helping to speed your ability to deliver functionality that has real value associated with it. Right? A use case is a nice little, nice little chunk of here's the problem that we already know we have. Here's the data that we're going to need to solve the problem that we already know we have. And here's the technology capabilities we need to use with the data to solve the problem that we already know we have. Right? So drawing it all out is like, yeah, this is going to create some value. And it does. It's really good. Right? So you can focus on, hey, what are the most valuable things we can do? And then the right thing to do is to orchestrate those strategically so that they are helping to build the foundational pieces that will enable scale later. Because the one thing you can't do is go from use cases to 12,000 as a lot of use cases. And that is a long time. And also you don't know that much because a lot of these tools are designed for exploratory use. You don't know the question yet, let alone the answer. So some of the use cases you do, there's always things you can do in a backlog. But the problem is you can't just point from use case, use case, five use cases, 10,000 use cases, a million use cases, it's done. Doesn't work that way, right? So here's the problem too. Your early wins and the use cases that you're able to define and, and execute on, they are delivering value quickly. The problem is that it leads to exactly the wrong expectations. Again, remember, we're supercharging the adoption. And now we are saying, hey, let's do these use cases, which deliver value really quickly. It can really lead to an unchecked, 
like almost infinite amount of expectations. Kind of what happened. All of a sudden, people heard about it, learned about it, saw the marketing, whatever, had, holy cow, this platform could do anything. I'm in. And then they're like, it might be three years till it can do the thing I need it to do. Ah, screw this platform, right? So that is the problem is that you start to create so much expectation that you can never fulfill because you can't use case your way into scale. Huge, important lesson. You can't use case your way into scale. Okay, so what happens next? Well, if you're not gonna use case your way to scale, you need to shift your mindset. You need to shift how you are engaging with your development, how you are building out the platform. You need to hit the afterburners and grow this puppy big. And it has to be so that you don't even know what the specific use cases are. There's 12,000 people. We can't even, we don't even know all their names, let alone what their needs are. But we do know that this platform with all the data and more technology capabilities than you could shake a stick at could handle a lot of it if we could deliver it to them with the navigational tools and those contextual tools so they can self-direct bringing in the data that they need and the tools that they need and the capabilities they need in a place where they can work and then create the science that they need to create. So we have to create something that allows them that kind of flexibility and freedom. You know what's easy relatively? Use cases. You know what's hard? Make it like Google. Generalized capability is exponentially more difficult than targeted discrete capabilities. Exponentially more difficult. So if you've established the expectation that you can just knock out these use cases over and over again, not only are your customers going to have the wrong sense of what's possible in what time frame, at what cost. But so is your business sponsors. So are the people who are leading this charge. The senior executives with the big picture vision, super pumped. When you're chucking out use cases, all this value is happening. You're starting to do some really cool stuff. And then you're like, yeah, we're going to need a um, hundred times more resources than you've given us. And they're like, get out. We don't have those. And then you have a problem. Right. So what the problem was for us is we focused on use cases for too long and let expectations run wild for too long. And it led to a place where we could no longer reconcile what was going to be necessary and the investment that was going to be needed to meet those expectations. The only rational choice at that point was to rein back the expectations. You, there was no investment. There was no way to add a hundred X dollars to that. No way. You know, and that's that's the problem. Right. And so and there was no way. I mean, there was just it wasn't that just people didn't want to invest what it takes to deliver scale. It's that, you know, you think about how much does it really take to change the outcomes for an R&D organization at the billion plus dollar level. It's not 10 million bucks. Right. It's not even 100 million bucks. Right. It's it's you have to really invest to transform something, especially with a lot of friction early on. And so we kind of, we, we, we burned out in a lot of ways because of those use cases, because of that early success. It was very difficult. And the only rational thing to do would to be reining in some of those expectations. That's also not the only problem because we'd added one more big challenge to this that um, was deeply frustrating. I ended up quitting over it basically. But the, the problem is, is that to do it once requires a certain set of capabilities, bringing in data once, mapping that data once, populating different technologies once, challenging, yes. Doing that daily, different challenging. Reconciling daily, dealing with exceptions daily. Those problems are operationally minded. Those are things that require a lot of staff, a lot of work, a lot of sophistication, a lot of maturity in what you're building. And if you don't have, during the time when you're focused on use cases, the discipline to build out that capability set, 
you're going to have problems. And when you move to a place where all these unchecked expectations, like, hey, uh, that data is two quarters old. Can we get some new data? You're like, yeah, that makes sense. We should give you that new data. And then the developers are like, oh, yeah, you can't refresh that. <laughs> Why can't we refresh that? Oh, because you said you didn't want to. So we didn't build that in. Who said that? Oh, the, the, the people that were responsible for designing it. <laughs> okay. Because there were bigger, important things. But the use case didn't include the ability to refresh. So it didn't get built. Right? So... Those are the kinds of things that happen constantly when you are trying to take what was initially prototyped through use cases and then initial run, run, run. You can only sprint so long until you have to really hit a pace that can be sustained. Operationalization, where you're monitoring things, where you've got a help desk, where you can respond to inquiries, where you can help people who've been given access to something understand, hey, where do you go for this? When you're building out new training, when you're building out new um, explanations and, and you're continuing the efforts of the adoption side, because you want to continue to build that interest, right? And if you're not able to take on the role of operationalization, don't build it in the first place, because you're going to only hurt that reputation over time. And so at some point, if you're not going to invest in the maturity necessary to operationalize those platform capabilities, you know, you, how many organizations have gone out and done a metadata management program or a data catalog program where they were able to populate the data catalog and then never touched it again. And within three months, the data catalog was useless because it never got updated. Same deal, same deal. So you can do it on the data level, you can do it on the context level, the metadata side, all right? So the problem is that we, we just didn't make it so that you could refresh the data and so that you could update it and that you we had we didn't have the staff to go in and deal with the exceptions that are caused by bringing in a whole bunch of new data. And we didn't have the sophistication to automate that because we didn't spend enough time in building out the bones of it. And so that, that you know, we ran too fast and we couldn't continue with the expectations that we'd set for ourselves. So one of the things that, and the learning that I had through all of this was realizing that though we said the right things early on and meant them, meant them very much, and the mission was all consuming and super important and needs to be done right. What we didn't have was a clear understanding or a clear acceptance of what it was really going to take. Or, you know, we were so motivated by the mission that I don't think anyone really, and including myself, I consider this a personal failure more than anybody else's. Um, you know, I, I didn't go out and really champion the fact that we were going to not be able to sustain this um, because, I mean, it was clear. It was clear as we said, hey, let's scale with more use cases. As soon as that was happening, we should have known, hey, we don't have the empowerment to do the things we know we need to do that we've been finding to do, yet we're accountable for making them happen. There's no way in that kind of imbalance you're going to be successful. And, you know, I can point back to things that I did wrong from the time I took the job that I wasn't really thinking were as important as now I look back and say, yeah, I really should have fought for that before I agreed to take the job in the first place. Because that's the time when you have the most negotiating leverage because they realize, hey, you have a skill set that you need to do. Nothing worse than being brought in for a job where you have the skills, but you don't have the resources and, and, and there's no way you can gain them. And so... You know, that that lack of, of balance between empowerment and accountability is really one of the most important things uh, to take away from this. We brought in the experts. We brought in a leadership team uh, in, in my platform work that was good uh, and that knew how to do this. But again, we didn't have enough people with, with the shovels. We didn't have enough people putting in, you know, the, the sandbags. We couldn't do it at scale. We could tell you what you needed to do, but you could only do so much with you know, some dollars and some consultants who didn't really understand why they were being asked to do different things. And that led to a bunch of um, poor design choices. You know, and that, that fell to me, you know, that, that was on me. So you know, I think that uh, too, I think we also suffered from a, you know, the scientists knew what it needed to do functionally, but we didn't have enough focus on the real work that it took. You know, I, I think about, you know, everybody knows, you know, one of my favorite business books is The Little Red Hen, right? And, and everybody knew what the bread should taste like. Everybody knew what the bread should look like. 
nobody knew how to do all the steps to get to the bread. And the people who did know couldn't find a way to fully articulate that. And so that was a lesson that I learned in this was, you know, that's on me for trying to do the best I could with what I had versus saying, we can't do this with what we have. And I wish I had, because this is not the failure of the organization. This was the failure of me. Right. And so I think too, there was some warning signs. There were a couple of canaries in the coal mine in that there were very few interested in some of the things that I was talking about. They, they would nod their head, but they didn't really see the importance of having, you know, metadata context, you know, the, um, the core data management capabilities. Data quality was seemed important to people, but they didn't understand what we have to do to make data quality actionable. And again, I take it as a personal failure that I wasn't able to deliver that because I just, I wasn't able to get that message across. And I think some of the reason I couldn't ties back to, to how I came into the position and my eagerness ended up hurting me because I wasn't willing to stand my ground and have the toughest decision because the mission was too important. I wasn't going to fight win, fights I couldn't win, but maybe I should have. So those are things that I think about now. And I want to at least relay as best I can, hey, these are the things that you may encounter and that you probably aren't going to hear about in these sessions outside of this. So trying to, to do that. So one of the things, just kind of putting a bow on it before we get into questions, you know, in the early days of the program, everybody said the right things. We were all very united. And, and you know, still, the people that are still working on this program, this program hasn't gone away. But I think they've had to, you know, realign some of those expectations. You know, but in doing that, and in the importance of it, especially in the context of a global pandemic, recruiting was pretty straightforward. It's like, hey, you want to come get in the fight? That's why I joined. I wanted to help during a pandemic find better medicine. There's no more important mission than that. And that's great. The marketing worked. We got a great team. You know, those of us from the outside, for people who didn't have that pharma experience before, you know, we're thrilled to be able to help in this kind of way. But when we looked at what the stated objectives were, you know, doubling the efficiency of a $6 billion R&D organization, and you look at the numbers behind it, you're like, wait, 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 um, I don't know if we have the right investment here to achieve those goals. And, you know, that to me is one lesson I've taken away. It's like, you know, your plans, your stated objectives without funding, that's just marketing. That's just a sales pitch. That is not a strategy. And that is something that I think we should all remind ourselves in, is that this isn't magic. This is a lot of work. And there's a reason why most data governance organizations fail to live up to their expectations, why most technology programs are far uh, more costly and take much longer than we expect, that many programs and projects are green, green, green until they're not. And that is predictable. And so we as leaders, as the, the preeminent data leaders in our organizations, we need to understand that it's up to us to call that out and to save ourselves both ourselves and our organization selves, save them the heartache of unwinnable battles, save them the heartache of unsuccessful, you know, when projects can't succeed or positions can't succeed. Data officers who have no staff, they're not chief of anything, right? Not okay. If we have objectives that we can't meet, comes back to that empowerment and accountability balance. We have to have the courage to call it out ahead of time. and work damn hard to get through it, you know, do the best darn job we can and hopefully it'll be okay. Right. So again, even, and this is the, you know, silver lining on the cloud, even if this program, as it continues and the good people that are still on it, most of the team that I hired is still there, you know, even if it's not as successful or doesn't meet the original stated objectives, they're moving the needle. And even in my mind, what is largely personal failures, most of this talk has been about things I should have known or should have done better myself. And even despite all of that, I have a faith and belief knowing the people involved and having great, great belief in their capabilities 
they may not achieve what we set out to achieve in the, in the first place, but I do think they are going to change the industry and ultimately the world through the work that they're doing. And that's still pretty darn good, right? So that's, that's okay too. You know, it may take longer than originally intended. It may not achieve everything they intended to do. The, the economics may not fully reach that, that original big, bold picture vision. Still do a lot of good, even at a percentage of what you intended. And so with that, final slide before we get into questions, you know, a couple of key lessons. It's very difficult, maybe impossible for a small team of outsiders to successfully change a large organizational culture, even when you get brought into in, the inside. Sometimes I think it's actually harder when you're brought into the inside, because at least if you're hired in as a consultant, they'll listen to you, you know, and that they, they, they will appreciate the scarcity of your knowledge. Once you get brought onto the inside, it's really, you know, it's kind of cliche, but it's true. You, you bring in these experts, and then as soon as they take the employee badge instead of the contractor badge, as soon as they're employee badge, nobody listens to them anymore. I certainly felt that way, whether or not it's true. Again, some of the marketing size, some of the words, the words can be persuasive, but the dollars, the investment will tell you a lot more about the intentions a lot more about the seriousness of the objectives. And so whether you're looking for a job or you're trying to figure out a program or you're trying to calibrate anything, look at where the dollars are. Look at where the real commitment is, not just the talk. The talk clouds your understanding much of the time. The dollars will sing more true. And then again, as I mentioned, the semi-successful programs can still accomplish incredible things. And I expect that the folks that are continuing on in the program that I've been talking about today, they're going to accomplish those great things. And so I really am excited to see what they're able to do. There's a bit of sadness for me that I'm not going to be part of it, but I also know that it wasn't a journey I could continue either. So with that, um, I will open it up for questions. I'm going to stop sharing um, and then uh, we will address some questions. So thank you for that. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you very much uh, for uh, for sharing your uh, experience from the field. Uh, so one question which I have is, uh, you talked a lot about adoption and culture and all those things. And how did you manage the data literacy part of it? Was it part of an integral component or do you want to throw some light on education or data literacy here? Yeah, I, data literacy is a is a tricky term in my opinion, because it almost just by its nature seems a little bit condescending. Like, or, and, and, and that's something you really want to avoid when scientists are concerned. Like you really don't want to come off that way saying, you know, you guys are a little bit data lit illiterate here. Let's help you. That That's probably not the way you want to do it. So we wouldn't call it that first off. But secondly, yeah. what we did have um, was a lot of really knowledgeable people who understood the data in their specific domain, what they lacked in a lot of cases was the ability to translate that into a platform that needed to achieve very large scale. So mm -hmm. that was where a lot of what I think our, our data literacy focus needed to be was how do we translate the, the deep detailed scientific knowledge into scalable, both just data artifacts as well as process. Because a lot of the things that happen in this kind of organization are very bespoke. They're very you know, ad hoc. They just kind of do the thing. They're, they're almost artisan in the way they work a lot of the time. And, and I'm amazed because I didn't understand any of it. But what was really cool is that you could take that and if you could extract consistency and establish a process around that, then it could scale. And so that's where a lot of the efforts were. And I think that's where a lot of it was successful. And then in the broad context, training and just helping people understand what was there and respecting the fact that these are brilliant people, some of whom have literally no experience in some of the stuff that we're talking about. So you had to kind of thread this needle between being very prescriptive and very like talk to the third grader type of, of thing without being condescending, mm. but also not making somebody feel bad that they should have known something. This is just completely outside of anyone's realm of expertise. So you had to be cognizant and, and sympathetic to that as well, because we've all been in those kinds of situations. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Um, so yeah, the, that's it. Uh, the, that's it from us, uh, Anthony. And uh, thank you very much. Anything else before uh, uh, before you leave? You want to share or say? 
Yeah, the, the last thing I would say is that don't let this experience discourage you from taking the big swing, whether you're talking about an internal initiative or in your own career. You know, I think the key thing is to just realize when you're taking that big swing, try to look at it from as many angles as possible and try to address any deficiencies as quickly as possible or uh, um, address any issues that you're able to observe sooner rather than later. And it's okay to recalibrate your initial expectations because that is often a lot easier to do than to completely change your investment model and what you're trying to achieve. And so those are things that, you know, just take a moment, whatever you're doing, to think a little bit more like an entrepreneur. Think a little bit more about how you can serve a constituency of customers inside your organization a lot of the times. But how can you serve them when they don't have to do anything you're asking them to do? How can you, can you, how can you uh, convince them or, first off, learn whether or not what you're proposing will really help them? And both respect them and try to serve them. I think one of the things that I like to talk about that I didn't really um, bake into this session is that when we're talking about like data governance or other data competencies or, or capabilities that we're bringing to an organization or whatever, a lot of times we think so much about ourselves and what we need to do to make those happen that a lot of times we lose the sentiment of saying, first and foremost, how can we help? How can we do something that really helps somebody? And that I almost think that to a, to a fault, that was my attitude coming in. It was like, how can I help? I just want to get in the fight. And it clouded my good judgment in a lot of ways that I could have made it more successful had I known through my leadership when to push back and say, you know what? I don't know if this is going the right way. We should address this earlier on. And, and so I, I did take it very personally when I decided that, you know what, I'm not the right leader to make this successful in the context that we now have. But I spent a lot of time thinking about like, what could I have done along the way where I wouldn't have had to make that choice when I did? All right. So we have one more question here uh, from Deepak, which says, uh, would an organizational structural change help? Yes. Um, you know, an organizational structural change would have helped. I think one of the big challenges that I, looking back on it, realized was, was one of the mistakes I made just coming in was I took a role that didn't have the optics of being high, high enough in the organizational structure to have the ability to do the things that I needed to do. And so because of that, I reported into an area that was far less focused on the things that were important to me and that didn't really have a good ability to help me in achieving those. It was it was not designed to create a scaled technology organization. We were all reporting outside of the formal IT organization. And because of that, building large scale technology operations was probably two to three times more difficult than it should have been. And I should have known um, but again, it comes back to like, I was so eager to help and it was the pandemic and all that. I just, I just wanted to get in and, and get going. And I really should have known that, oh, uh, this is, could cause a lot of trouble by not being positioned the way it should have been. And, and that, I, I don't know that that alone doomed us, but it certainly was something I reflect back on and say, boy, that organizational structure did not help us at all in that. Okay. So that's it uh, from all of us here. Uh, Anthony, thank you very much for your time once again, sir. It was great uh, listening to you. I personally enjoyed it. I, I was there throughout your session. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so making, much for the opportunity to speak. Making and notes. Enjoy, <laughs> enjoy the rest of the week. Okay, see you. Take care. Take care. Thanks.